I found an episode of a TV show that was banned in Ireland by Sugar Soad. I was practically grinning ear to ear as I walked into my home carrying the videotape. My months-long search was finally over as I'd finally found the tape. I heard rumors over the years of the missing episode of a popular Irish children's show about a talking puppet. It had supposedly been banned after numerous children had plucked out their own eyeballs after watching it. Couldn't believe my luck after spotting it sitting forgotten in an estate sale. I ring a few of my friends and organize to get together so we could all watch it. Most of them were a bit reluctant to attend, but the offer of free beer and food convinced them. My girlfriend Samantha did all the cooking as I connected the video cassette player to the television. My best friend Kenny was, unsurprisingly, the first to arrive and immediately made a beeline to the fridge to grab a beer. The rest of the guests arrived in dribs and drabs until we were all finally here. It was a bit of a tight squeeze, but we all got comfortable and prepared to watch the episode. I felt a shiver run on my spine as I pressed play as the room suddenly went pitch black. I practically jumped out of my skin as Samantha let out an ear-splitting scream in my ear. I could hear a lot of panicked voices and I stumbled toward the kitchen to find a fuse box. I let out a sigh of relief as I managed to get the power back on. I turned around to apologize to everyone and froze in place as I saw the small wooden box that had suddenly appeared on the table. I recognized it immediately as the box was one of the props from the television show. The other guests were huddled together staring at the box. Kenny turned to me and began congratulating me for an epic practical joke, but his words were cut off as the box slowly opened with a disconcerting creak. A shiver ran down my spine as a puppet popped its head out and moved its head from side to side as if studying us. Her hair was bobbing with each movement of her head. Kinney moved forward toward the box, and I wanted to scream at him to stop, but my voice got caught in my throat. The puppet raised its head to peer up at Kenny as he towered over her. He was slurring his words as he kept mumbling about a practical joke. I watched in dread as he reached his box into the hand and began rooting for something. His face went deathly pale as he exclaimed that something was pulling on his arm. He let out a whimper as his body was forcibly dragged toward the box. I rushed forward and grabbed his other arm and tried to free him. Kenny's face was inches from my arm and I saw the tiny little dribble of blood coming out of his mouth. We were suddenly wrenched toward the box and his head disappeared inside. The puppet sat on the precipice of the box and I flinched away as it raised its arm toward me. I lost my grip on Kenny and the last of his body was hauled inside the box. A fountain of blood shot into the air and we were all quickly drenched in blood. The puppet's green clothing was now as red as her hair. Screams shook the room as the other guests who had up to now hadn't moved suddenly began running for the door. A familiar voice boomed into our skulls as our legs locked into place. Our feet turned of our own accord and turned to face the puppet. She began speaking in a voice that years ago had been a mainstay in my childhood. Her once cheerful voice now executed malevolence as she told us that we couldn't leave until we all made a sacrifice. Knives appeared in each of our hands as her voice commanded us to do her bidding. Utter pandemonium broke out as people began stabbing each other without prejudice. I felt the blade stab into the back of my shoulder and spun around to see Samantha standing there with an almost manic look on her face. Her blade was wrenched from her grip with my sudden movement and clattered to the floor. She began clawing at my face and I instinctively raised my hands to protect myself. Her attacks quickly petered out and I lowered my arms to see her throat had been cut open. A look of realization crossed over her face as she locked eyes with me before kneeling over dead. I noticed blood dripping from one of my blades and discovered to my horror that I had stabbed her while raising my arms. It was a thunderous noise that shook the building and I looked over to see the puppet clapping its hand while staring at me. Everyone else lay on the floor in pools of their own blood. Tears streamed down my cheeks as I told the puppet 
that I had given her a sacrifice and that she now had to leave. She let out a laugh and explained that I would need to give her my eyeballs in exchange for my life. I balanced myself and tried not to scream as I forced the blade into my eye sockets and began cutting. And within minutes, I'd managed to tear out both eyeballs from my skull and I could feel blood coursing down my face as I stood there in pitch darkness. I felt tiny hands snatch the eyeballs from my grip. I tried to block the sounds of the popping noises as it crushed them beneath its grip. I don't know how long I stood there unmoving, but eventually mustered up the courage to move forward. I tripped over the bodies of my friends as I desperately tried to reach the door. I let out a sigh of relief as I turned the handle and felt the cold air caress my cheek. I wondered if anyone would ever believe my story as I went to search for help. Does anyone remember an arcade game called Treasure Defender? By Drecknaw. I just have to know whether anyone's experienced something like this. I remember the year quite well. It was 1991, if that helps at all. I even remember the exact date. June 12th. 1991. No, that last part is a lie, to be honest. I don't remember the exact day that it happened. I just happened to find a newspaper clipping report on that day, and so it had to have been on that day. I was a frequent visitor to the local arcade. I don't think I can give out any more detailed information without betraying the identities of several people involved, most of them who are still alive today, so I'll leave it at that. It was a slow summer, and I'd managed to make my way through most of the games there. I had a bag of quarters earned from mowing lawns around the neighborhood, but there was honestly really nothing that piqued my interest enough to play. Until I saw it in the corner. Is that a new game? I asked someone. I don't know, the guy said, and returned to the game he was playing. I figured, why not give it a shot, and made my way over to it. Treasure Defender, it said in bright golden text. I put a quarter in. Level 1 began immediately. Now, back in the day, most games didn't have detailed instructions on how to play them. It wasn't even like modern times where you can just whip out your phone and get a walkthrough. As such, I was left a bit confused on what to do. There was a map on screen. It was divided into four rooms. Each of them was empty, but led into each other. There was a circle on the screen and a triangle. Next to the triangle, there was a gold coin. Defend your treasure, the screen said on top. No further instructions than that. The interface only consisted of a joystick and a red button. I moved the joystick and the triangle began moving around. As I would make a move, the circle moved on its own. Okay, so I was the triangle. The enemy was the circle. So what did the red button do? I pressed it, and the triangle fired a shot. Alright, so that was my weapon. The gameplay was childishly easy, as the circle made no attempt to evade me. Once it was in my line of sight, I fired, and it vanished from the screen. Congratulations! screen flashed. I got a thousand points for clearing the level, and another thousand because my treasure was intact. Right, now that I thought about it, the circle was moving toward the gold coin. That was probably what it was programmed to do. Level 2 was similar, and I cleared it easily. It was on level 3 that something strange happened. The map was more complex. There were these X marks on the game screen which I couldn't get past, which were most likely meant to be obstacles. I was still a triangle, but there were two gold coins on the screen. This time, pressing the red button did nothing. I was a bit surprised, but when I look back on that memory, something stands out to me that didn't at the time. There was an icon of an axe. It was in a different room, and I thought I could still shoot, so I ended up wasting my moves going back and forth, wondering what was happening. Again, the game didn't give me any additional info that could be helpful. What happened was that the circle caught up to me. 
I had no clue what to do, so I just ran at it, and my triangle disappeared. Game over, came the message on the screen. I sighed. Again, at the time, there was no real way to know how to play a game other than asking your buddies about it. My friends were either busy that day or out of town, but it didn't look like anyone else had played that game yet, given that it was new. Before I could put another quarter in, a message popped up. Play again? That was odd. Games back in the day were designed to suck out as many quarters as possible from you. This was giving me another chance, just like that? I picked yes for a message to pop up. Will you stake your own treasure? I had no idea what that meant, but thought nothing of it as I hit yes. I frowned. The map was different from before. Again, hitting the red button did nothing. However, I did see the gun icon in another room. I finally pieced together what I had to do and... Huh? The gold coin, my treasure, so to speak, was moving. This hadn't happened before. Unsure of what to do, I went for the gun and went ahead with finishing off the circle. The gold coin continued to move as I did this, and I was unsure if I was supposed to pick it up or not, but a congratulations popped up on the screen, and I also got the bonus score for saving my treasure, so it looked like what I did was right. To my surprise, the game ended at that. It was rather quick if there were only four levels, and at this point I just walked away disappointed looking for another game to play. I must have been at the arcade for an hour before the police showed up. There had been an incident at my house. A robber had gotten in. Thankfully, my dad had fetched his gun in time and, well, the robber was dead. But both my dad and my little sister were safe, though understandably very shaken. All thoughts of that dumb game left my head until more news began coming out about the day. It appeared that there had been a string of robberies in the town that day. Mr. Jenkins had his house broken into, and the robber tried to get into his safe before he shot him down, much like my father had. What made my skin crawl, though, was what happened to Miss Bertha. I didn't know her at all before the incident. It was when her story became the focus of that night's news that I began to put it all together. Someone had broken into her house as well. Only she hadn't been so lucky, and the intruder, after having killed her, had taken her twin babies away. The local police were on high alert, searching for them, but to my knowledge, nothing turned up regarding those children till this day. I wouldn't have thought any more of it until the reporter went into the next room. A room with an axe in it. No. It couldn't be. But when my father later recounted what had happened to the cops for the twelfth time, saying how he had rushed into the den to fetch his gun, and my sister described how she was pacing around the room in terror that I realized what had happened. The gold coins were treasure, but not just money like with Mr. Jenkins. For Miss Bertha, it had been her twins, hence the two coins on the screen. For me, it was my little sister. You might think that I'm overthinking this, but the thing is that it was highly unusual for there to be a break-in in my town. For there to be three that I know of. I know there was a fourth level I skipped out, but never found a corresponding incident. In one night? It can't have been a coincidence. I never was able to find the game at the arcade again. I asked around, but no one seemed to remember it. I honestly would have let the matter rest, but the thing is that I couldn't get it out of my mind. I saw the image of Miss Bertha's dead body on the television, and it has haunted my dreams since then. Many people in my town wondered why she hadn't taken her children and ran, but I had a hunch I knew why. It was my fault. I should have picked up on how to play the game earlier. If I had, she might have still been alive, and those children would have grown up living happy, normal lives. It's a burden I've been carrying ever since. I just wanted to know, though. 
did this happen to someone else out there? I... I guess I just want to confirm whether my theory is right. That the game did cause everything and that I was at fault for Miss Bertha's death. If it turns out that it was just a harmless game that was recalled one day, then I guess I really had nothing to do with it. I guess my conscience really needs it. The reason the works of art are kept in secure locations isn't to keep them safe, but to keep us safe from them by Sugar Soad. I was part of a group of people that were trying to protest the use of oil. We planned to break into a museum in Ireland to deface some of the works of art in the hopes of raising awareness for our group and its cause. I didn't really believe in their ideology, but my friends were joining and their leader Susan was very charismatic. My friends arrived outside the museum at 4 a.m., knowing that we had a couple of hours until the staff arrived. One of the group, Linda, managed to get us in and disable the security systems. I couldn't help but marvel at some of the exhibits as they were truly breathtaking. My best friend Anne nudged and gave me a scowl to remind me what we were here to do. The group quickly picked a painting that showed someone being tortured in the throes of hell. Two of the group, Chloe and Fiona, glued themselves to the painting while I was handed the paint to throw all over the painting. My eyes were transfixed by the painting as it was so beautiful. Eventually, Anne got irritated and snatched the paint out of my hands and flung it all over the painting. We were all forced to cover our ears as an ear-splitting shriek tore through the building. It seemed to go on for an eternity, but probably only lasted a few seconds. The shriek eventually died down, leaving us looking around with a bewildered look on our faces. Every fiber of my being was shouting at me to run, but my feet were held in place by some unknown malevolent force. A small fog began pouring out of every painting and sculpture and pulling around the floor. I could sense eyes watching us from all directions, but couldn't see anyone around. We attempted to huddle together in the hopes of safety in numbers. Fiona and Chloe suddenly began screaming and I looked over to see flames starting to consume their feet. I sprinted off and quickly returned with a fire extinguisher and began spraying at the flames but to no avail. The heat was intense and we were forced to back away from their burning bodies. The screams petered out as their bodies became nothing more than blackened husks. I let out an involuntary moan as Fiona raised her head one last time and gave an accusatory look before slumping dead to the floor. The rest of us were frozen in place, unable to comprehend what we had just witnessed. We were dragged out of our days by the sounds of something moving across the floor in the next room. I watched in wonder as a number of statues dragged themselves inside the doorway, blocking our escape. The statues were meant to represent the children that had died during the famine. They began inching into the room and moved into the furthest corner away from them. Linda let out an incomprehensible shout and rushed forward, which caused the stampedes as we all tried to flee. We all darted in different directions, trying desperately to escape the statues. I felt a hand shove me in the back and fell at the feet of one of the statues. I looked up to see Susan give me an apologetic look as she tried to jump over me. The statue's hand shot up and latched onto her leg and dragged her to the floor. She used her underfoot to try and break its grip, but it was no use. The statue pulled her forward until her head was within reach. Its grip on her leg released before she had a chance to flee. It placed both hands on the side of her head. I laid on the floor watching as it increased the pressure on her head. Blood began pouring out of every orifice as her face went slack. Her eyeballs popped out of her skull and I followed their course as they landed across the room in the paint bucket we'd brought. My attention was brought back to Susan as I heard a sickening thud and realized her skull had been crushed. Her body collapsed to the floor and began twitching for a few moments before going deathly still. My body reacted on instinct as it pushed me off the floor and lunged past the statue. I felt a hand graze my leg, but I managed to evade its grip. I ran into the next room to a scene of utter chaos. 
Two of the other girls were being pulled into one of the paintings. Their faces were becoming more distorted the closer they got to the painting. They were letting out a keening noise that brutally cut off as they disappeared within the painting. I took off running in the hopes of reaching an exit. I was forced to dodge away from living sculptures that now roamed freely around the museum. I froze in place as I spotted Linda standing there in front of me. She stood stock still with her back to me and appeared to be completely nude. There was something wrong with her body, but my panicked brain didn't understand what it was. My eyes darted in all directions as I moved around to face her. My heart was pounding in my chest as I stared at her body. Her arms and legs had been torn in half and were forced into a pose that reminded me of the Vitruvian man. I turned and fled away from her as I looked into her eyes and she met my gaze. I spotted the exit in the distance and practically sprinted towards it. I slid to a halt as a painting fell off the wall and two hands came out of it and used them to stand upright. I flinched away as I felt a hand on my shoulder and spun around to see Anne standing there. Her face was white as a sheet and I could see a touch of madness in her eyes. There were sounds of movement behind us and I peered around the corner to see all the paintings and statues coming this way. Anne nodded at me and we both rushed forward toward the exit. I tried to dodge around the painting that blocked my way, but its hands managed to get a grip on my jeans and began pulling me toward it. I looked back to see the painting was now flat on the ground and knew that it was trying to drag me inside it. My feet were touching the edge of the painting when Anne appeared out of nowhere and began stamping her foot down on the arm. The grip on my leg loosened and I was able to free myself and rolled away to safety. I turned around to thank Anne and let out a whimper. The arms had pulled her leg into the painting and Anne mouthed for me to run as it was already too late. Tears streamed down my cheeks as her body sunk further and further into the painting until she vanished from sight. I looked up to see the other museum exhibits moving toward me and I turned, rushed backward toward the exit. I returned to the museum a few weeks later and walked from room to room with the other visitors. No one else noticed the changes to the paintings, but I spotted the faces of my friends now locked in a never-ending scream that no one would ever hear. I felt an overwhelming sense of anguish as I knew that these people who were once my friends were now trapped for eternity amongst these works of art. I used an image-generating AI. It made some terrifying pictures. By Drecknaw. It started out simple enough. I was bored. That was it, really. Bored and just browsing social media when I saw it. It was an incredible piece of art. Stunning, really. Posted by one of my friends. Someone who I knew had never picked up a paintbrush in their lives, so I wanted to know the artist. Except in their description, they mentioned that it was generated by an AI. I don't want any of you stumbling onto the site in case something happens to you like it did with me, but let's just say that I fell for it and decided to visit the site myself. I wanted a profile pic. It was supposed to be a drawing of a dog near a bunch of sunflowers. That's how I thought of it, but it was kind of hard to get an actual artist to draw it, especially when you don't have any money. I trusted the AI generator, and... Though it took a few attempts, I got an image that was good enough to use. Fascinated, I tried other things I wanted drawn. Most of them weren't too bad to be used, but I would occasionally find one that looked pretty good. Then, as I got bored and had trouble thinking of ideas, I decided to input a prompt that in hindsight, I should never have. Draw a picture of me. If you've never used an AI generating software before, essentially you input a string of text describing what you want to see. Of course, I was just curious what to know the software would spit out when I put that kind of prompt in. There was no way it knew what I looked like. For an extra kick, I added in, draw a picture of me, manga style. And then I hit generate and waited for a mess of pixels to pop up. Instead, I had a bit of trouble initially figuring out what it was that I was looking at. There was a man with his face turned down. 
He had black hair and was sitting at a restaurant. He could be any place, or so I think, when I saw the sign in the background. The chill went down my spine. I opened up my phone. Yeah, that's right. I had been to that place a week ago. I think I even took a selfie. Yeah, the AI had even gotten my outfit right. Now, if you've never used an AI to generate images before, you should probably know that in general it isn't very good at it. At least not most modern AI. It's usually very easy to tell when something is AI generated. The computer often gets things wrong that no human would, like drawing someone's lip wrong or giving someone an extra hand. Actually, a large majority of the errors I'd noticed whenever I put in a command were related to things like that. Actually, it can be quite uncanny if you try to get an AI to make a human face. Some of them were nightmare inducing to say the least. It also has problems with letters or making signs, so the odds that it would spell out the restaurant's name like that perfectly were close to zero. But there was no way that it could have known where I was that day. But I had to be sure. There was an option to edit an image you had made. I clicked on it and then changed the prompt. Draw a picture of me as a black and white photograph. I clicked on the generate button once again and I nearly physically recoiled from the screen. It was... perfect. A perfect render of what I looked like. I panicked. My laptop had no built-in camera and I'd never used one, so how did it know what I looked like? Did it look through my social media? But now, the terms of service said that it wouldn't work with photographs of real people. I should have probably left it at that. Turned the computer off and went to sleep, trying to ignore what had happened, like it was just a bad dream. But I didn't. I had to go further. A photograph of my car. The AI even got the dent in the rear down to a T. A charcoal drawing in my bedroom. Yeah, there was no mistaking it. But how? How was it spying on me? My phone, that was a possibility, but unless I'd been hacked, there should have been no way to... Again, I should have stopped there, turned the computer off, and gone to sleep, but I didn't. A crime scene photograph of the day I'll die. My heart froze. It was me... Lying down with a bullet wound in my chest, my lifeless eyes gazed up at the ceiling. A pool of blood trickled around my corpse. There was a time stamp in the corner. A time that was only 30 minutes from now. I wanted to shut it off right there and then, but I couldn't bring myself to. I had to know more, but... This couldn't be real, could it? A picture of who was going to kill me. An image of a green car popped up. The driver was hidden in shadow, but there was a clear license plate on it. I had enough at that point that I turned the computer off. It was a bad dream. Yeah, that's right. This was all that was. I got up to go to bed when I saw it. Outside my window, a car had just come to a stop across the street green. I honestly don't know what to do now, guys. I can't see the license plate, but something tells me that it'll be the same as in the picture, and I'm not dumb enough to go out to check. The clock's still ticking, just ten minutes until the time on the photograph. I've already called the cops, but I have a feeling they won't be here in time. As it is, I don't think they would have taken my complaint seriously if I gave them a full picture. I just told them that there was an armed intruder approaching my house. And now, come to think of it, I can hear footsteps outside. I'm not sure if I should run at this point, and if so, to where? Would it make a difference? Was the photograph some kind of prophecy from the AI? Or, 
now that I knew it was going to happen, could I change things? Sorry, I... I have to run. Someone's turning my doorknob. Nowhere to run now. I'll just have to try and hide. Wish me luck, guys. We located a plane that famously vanished without a trace. By Sugar Soda. I got a call to say that a missing plane had landed in Shannon Airport in Ireland. I remember the news stories from when it disappeared as people had launched a huge search in the hopes of finding it. The locals have been unable to reach contact with anybody on board. I was asked to lend my experience in the hopes of finally finding out where it had been. The next few days, we tried everything we could think of to talk to the people inside. We decided to keep this as secret as possible and managed to convince everyone to keep this a secret. Luckily, they agreed as they were curious as to what was going on. We removed parts of the plane and then moved it to a secure building so we could properly analyze everything. We spent the last number of years trying desperately to get inside as nothing we tried would work. Nothing we used could damage the exterior of the plane as it now seemed impregnable. Looking through the windows was useless as it was pitch black inside and no light could penetrate the darkness. About six months ago, while I was walking by, I tried one of the doors randomly as it had become one of my daily habits. I froze in shock as the door handle began to turn. I immediately grabbed my phone and called my superior as I didn't want to do this alone. Within an hour, the building was full of people rushing around in anticipation of what we would discover inside. We used a robot to open the door as we were afraid of something else being inside. We watched from our monitors as the robot slowly twisted the door and it swung open. I could see the confusion on everyone's faces as we gazed at the liquid that filled the plane. The liquid should have come pouring out when the door had opened, but it just stayed frozen in place. It took a minute or two for anyone to react as everyone was just staring at the monitors. Eventually, someone began issuing orders, and we all started grabbing equipment as we needed to know what was going on inside. I was tasked with collecting some of the liquid as we needed to know what it was so we could determine where the plane had been all that time. I ran a few tests on the liquid, and we were all stunned to discover that it was just plain seawater. I just kept thinking to myself, how the hell did seawater get into a damn airplane? I suggested sending in a piece of submersible equipment with cameras attached so that we could at least see inside. My superiors loved the idea and began organizing to collect what we needed. We hired a professional who was tasked with navigating the submersible inside the cabin. We stared at the monitors once again as the submersible, which we nicknamed Doris, made its way inside. We all watched in wonder as the feed slowly showed the interior. It had evidently been damaged by its exposure to the seawater, and you could see a number of small fish swimming around. The camera turned and we all stood there, our mouths hanging agape as the feed showed passengers still sitting in their seats. They all sat stock in their seats, gazing toward the front of the plane. Their bodies had begun to rot, probably due to the long-term exposure of the seawater or the fact that they'd been dead for many years. Their mouths were all hanging open, which seemed to give off the impression that they were all smiling at us. Doris slowly began to get closer, and there were a couple of screams from my colleagues as the passengers' heads all suddenly turned and stared at the screen. They didn't move and just continued gazing at the screen as Doris was quickly removed from the plane. No one knew what to do and we set a guard outside the plane while the bigwigs decided what the right course of action would be. We've sent Doris in on a daily basis to make sure nothing has changed. Thankfully their corpses just stayed in their seats while gazing at Doris any time she enters. We noticed a change in their behavior last week. They're now moving around the cabin during the day, but never move when Doris is inside. 
I was tasked with sending Doris in today, and I wasn't looking forward to it as I always hated seeing the expressions on their rotten faces. I started up Doris and was worried there may have been an obstruction as she seemed to be stuck on something. It took me a few minutes to get her loose as I was bad at using the controls. I watched the camera turn and let out a scream as the feed suddenly showed a smiling face blocking the screen. One of my colleagues took over the controls and he was more adept at it. The view panned around to show a line of passengers patiently queuing up to the door. They were all holding onto their bags and anything else they must have brought on board with them. They stood as still as statues while having that unnerving smile on their faces. Dozens of armed soldiers and scientists now stand outside the plane as we await the passengers. We don't know where they were while they were missing or why they suddenly want to leave. I just hope to God letting them out is a good idea. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. I do have a quick question for you based on the first story that we read, the one about the cursed television show. What was your favorite show as a kid? What did you grow up watching? I know my audience is a bit older than I am. I would say 30s or 40s. But anyone born in the 90s, growing up in the early 2000s like I did, you'll probably agree when I say that things like Hey Arnold, Rugrats, Ren and Stimpy, uh, Rocco's Modern Life, Spongebob to an extent were a lot of my favorite cartoons. But even going younger than that, I would say uh, Blue's Clues, Little Bear was a really big one that I really, really loved watching and just pretty much anything on Nickelodeon at that point. I wasn't a huge Disney Channel fan or even a Cartoon Network fan. I do remember Courage the Cowardly Dog and a couple of other Disney shows like American Dragon Jake Long and Kim Possible, but those are more teenager shows, I would say. Anyway, let me know down in the comment section below what you watched growing up as a kid. I would love to hear some recommendations, maybe take a little trip down memory lane. Let me know down in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. If you did, let me know as well. Leave a like, a comment, and let me know what you'd like to hear next. Take care out there, everyone.